right now, the Bram Weinstein Show on Washington's new home for sports, ESPN 630. Hey, babies. Hey, babies. Hey, babies. Hi, everyone. Big night in my house, everyone. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Still haven't won. Huh? Still haven't won. Yeah. But they, well, the, the Fever's record stinks, too, right? Sure, but they've won. They've won, yes. They've won. They won the game everyone got mad about. That's they right. They won that game. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Actually. Exactly. Uh, I'm going to play a Caitlin Clark bite from uh, Cap One today. Shoot around. Here mm-hmm. we're, getting, we're at the point now where WNBA shoot around sound makes, you know, makes, uh, makes news because she was asked about all the fallout. And it's the first time I've seen her literally speak about it. But I'll play that in a bit. Let's just start with the NBA Finals today, which was a total, like, uh-oh. Your boy. Chris uh-oh. Taps. Oh, that was okay. a hell of a first half. Okay. <laughs> they were not re- I've never seen a team laying like, Dude. what the hell? Like, they were shocked at Chris I Tapps. love Boston. I love it. <laughs> it's like it's like, it's like like Munich. I love it here. Uh, over, yeah. My mind over under was yeah. 90 seconds before you dropped that. And oh. you, you just hit the under on that. Well, <laughs> like, this won't happen, but the off of that, the Chris Tapps Porzingis for MVP. Uh-huh. Yes. Train yeah. got rolling. <laughs> and after what happened last night, Night because it was that was ridiculous. It was, he, he took did. over. He took over the first and, half. And you know, like the Mavs got shook bad. They had mm-hmm. terrible turnovers. Like after, like it, like they got hit by a train and got <laughs> run over. And Porzingis comes in. He's big smiles on his face. They're talking about how happy he is in Boston. First ever NBA Finals game. He'd never gotten out of the first round. In fact, the stat of the night was Derek Lively has played more playoff games than Chris Stapp's Porzingis has. <laughs> Just by virtue of this one run, he's he played more. So here's, you know, this guy who people forget, he was Wembenyama when he came into the league. He was the unicorn. He right. was the guy who could ball control, shoot deep threes, could post up. Like, he was the all-everything player. And then he was a little too young for New York. Then he had knee injuries. Then he went to Dallas. That didn't go well. Came here was really, really good. People forget that part. Was really, really good. And then what was the trade? What did we trade? Because once we traded Beal, I was like, well, we had to do that. I don't remember. Like, I remember they traded Porzingis, and I remember thinking, did we really have to do that? Like, I I know we're resetting, but why did we go out of our way to do that? It was a three-team trade. The Celtics got uh, Porzingis the number 25 overall pick in last year's draft from the Grizzlies and a 2024 first round pick top four protected from the Warriors. The Uh Grizzlies got Marcus Smart. Remember that's Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that that got switched because it wasn't supposed to be that, but something, I can't remember, something fell through and they had to like do it last minute and they did it anyway. The Wizards got Tyus Jones, Gallinari, Mike Muscala, and the number 35 overall pick last season. All right, so think about that for a second. Like, no offense to Tyus Jones because Gallinari's old and, you know, was was a movable part. The 35th overall pick is it's the 35th overall pick. And what was the other one? And Muscala, who's, again, yeah. a backup, movable part, but backup right. player. We didn't get much back sure. for him. Right. Um, and I remember thinking at the time, I'm like, all right, I get it. Like, we're rebooting and all that stuff. But isn't there a case to be made, like, that we could just, why wouldn't we keep him? Like, what, what's, no. why wouldn't you? No, because th- this is, don't get, don't get wrapped up in what Porzingis did that affects the overall rebuild. Because they would have won games because of Porzingis. They would have won games and because I, of him. That's I, right. I was very. If they mo- had kept Kuzma, they were trading Beal. They right. got Pool. They would have had Pool Kuzma Porzingis. Like that actually, <laughs> they actually sound bad. <laughs> probably would have made that play-in thing with they that. Would have gone five hundred. Yeah, or it, or something. Well, they never go five hundred. Well, It'd be somewhere. You know I mean. It'd be. Within the play in games strike. under 500 and still making into the play. The yeah. 9, 10, whatever. Like right. they would have made it that far with that. Right. Exactly. So they so. had to move. But I remember thinking at the, after they traded Beal, because they had to move Beal because the contract was unwieldy and he shouldn't be your P1 player. You're not building around him anymore. Right. That made sense. When they moved Porzingis, I remember thinking at the time, boy, they didn't really get much for him. They were just getting out of it to start the reboot over. And we're just doing Boston an enormous favor here because he had completely turned his career around here. Like he was really good. No one noticed outside of this area, but he was really good here. Then he goes up there. He had a very good season. Then he got hurt. And they were basically saying, like, if he comes back, it could be the big difference. And look what happened in game one. Right. 
that dude was very happy to play basketball last <laughs> night and was beyond on fire. Yes. Like beyond. He hit two threes that were from 29 feet and out. Yeah. With people in his face. He faced up a couple guys, jacked them in the stomach, and then hit shots in their face. Like, faced them up. Then he had that one where he spun around a guy and ran down the lane and dunked it. Yep. <laughs> and that was part of the, whatever, 21-2 to two run or whatever they had. They had 37 points after the first quarter. Like, Dallas barely got over that number by halftime. Right. So that game right. got turned upside down yeah, cause fast it, on them. It really what it did, too, is no matter how good the second half was going to start, they weren't. You know, in surrounding, you know, they making got it lead. to eight, which I was I surprised. Know, but know. then the the Celtics hit the gas again and and built it back up to thirteen seventeen right. like immediately. Yes. So because there was a moment there in the third quarter, where I was like, God, that deficit's getting getting nicked away very quickly right. here. Right. But you know, like it, it was too big of a it was too big of a deficit. And I mean, listen, I like until it goes to Dallas and we see what happens in Game Three, it's hard to really know. No, but like that looked like a mismatch last night, like well, a bat, like. Just think about Tatum for a moment. I don't know what his numbers were, but he didn't even really have to have a major effect on the game, and right. they were blowing them out. Well, and um, the stat that I was looking at, because I was paying attention to it for monetary reasons, was all of the um, Mavericks and their assist numbers. Did you happen to see that? No. Of how they were moving the ball around? You want to know who led the Mavericks in assists last night? Easy name. Kyrie. Yeah. You want to know how many he had? Five. Two. Wow. Uh-huh. That's wow. when I was like, they're, I mean, in that first game, you're finished. Two. Yeah. Well, I I felt going in. He was the only one with two, by the way. I felt going <laughs> in. I go, the whole series is actually him with Holiday on him. I go, that's the whole series to me. Right. Like, if he ends up, you know, being a prolific scorer, because you know Luke is going to get his. If he ends up being a prolific scorer, then they got a shot. You know, like, they got a full-on, I mean, he's a Hall of Fame player, so, like, they got a full-on shot. He was, like, 6 for 21, yep. something like right. that last night. Right. Apparently couldn't get the ball to anybody. Yep. And they had to, they threw up the white flag early, which I oh, thought yeah. was the right thing sure, to do. Sure, five minutes left, yeah. Was fine. Yeah, I thought yeah. it was the right thing to do, because they were getting blown out. They yep. weren't going to come back. Why Why empty the tank in a game you're not, so what, you lose by seven? Mm -hmm. by empty, So what? Like, so I thought they did the right thing there. They got to regroup big time. Yeah. Like that was, and I don't know that they can because that look, it just felt like such a mismatch. And if if Boston's going to shoot the way they did early um, for any stretch of time, Dallas has no shot. What? Like they, they really don't. If they're going to do that, they're going to, nobody's going to be able to beat them. It got to be in the second half too. Um, and I was listening to uh, the ESPN radio broadcast because I was just like making dinner or whatever. And Mark Kestisher very fast in the second half was like, hey, want to set the tone here again. You know, when we asked Kyrie about the whole returning to Boston thing, he's taken the high road and said, like, he's forgiven yeah. himself. Very, very zen Kyrie was about it. He said, though, in the third quarter or maybe the beginning of the fourth quarter, some fans were like, go home, Kyrie, go home. And he looked up at them and he says, I'm right here. I'm right here. Now, that's not like big trash talk compared to years past, whatever. But here's the guy that said he was going to be perfectly yeah. fine and he was going to be at peace with the fans. And all of a sudden, the second half of the first game, he's already jawing with them yeah. face to face. Like, well, even I was kind of like, oh, uh oh, like, are he, we already getting to you, too? He he had three shook moments, which was surprising from him. Uh, like, I agree. He hit he had one shot that hit like side of the backboard. Yes. He had one where he tried to like make a move down the lane and fell. Yeah. He had a pass <laughs> that was like behind three guys and like went out of bounds in the backcourt. So he had yeah. three like bad moments. Like, when it spiraled early on them, they looked like totally shook. Yes. Yes. And, you know, once that lead got to what that lead was, even though the Mavericks, I'll give them credit, they they made a game of it in the third quarter. Like, it was obvious who the better team was. Mm -hmm. And, man, I mean, like, so this may, no wonder they're prohibitive favorites. Like, Vegas was all over yeah. this. They made the massive favorites, and everyone's going, I don't know, they don't look the part, <laughs> and all this stuff. They rolled those yeah. dudes last night. Well, totally rolled them. I thought, I thought out of all the games last night was going to be the easiest because the Celtics have had five, six, seven days off in every single series, and they've been perfectly fine. The Mavs haven't. The Mavs yeah. have had longer series and jump right into the next one. How are they going to treat that week off? They probably didn't really even know because it was the first time they were doing it during this run. Celtics know what they yeah. had to do to be ready for that, and it was apparent. That you know, after ready. seeing Porzingis, and I'm sure, like, you know, his endurance was going to be tested because he hadn't played in over yeah, a month, right. whatever. But, like, now after seeing him, it makes me believe he could have come back in the Indiana series if he had to. I agree. But he I agree. didn't. Yeah. But he didn't. So they were able to just 
shelve him. Yep. They were able to once Halliburton went out, the, Indiana had no shot, so there was no rush to try to get him back. Let him rest, and then all week it kind of got out the day before when they were like, "Yeah, he doesn't have a minutes restriction." And I went, "Uh oh, yep. mm-hmm. he's fine." So they like the easy road with all the injuries that occurred leading up to the finals allowed them to not force him to come back early. I'm guessing in in a in a different scenario where Indiana's you know neck and neck with him in a two two series. After seeing him last night, I 100 percent believe he would have played if he had to, like mm-hmm. in a game six or seven against them. But they didn't need him to, right. so they were able to sit him. That's how good they are. Well, I think too. I think mostly with him, it's got to be pain management because it's a calf injury. And yeah. they, you saw him warming up yesterday in the second half of like having it wrapped up and yeah. doing some calf raises and that stuff. I bet you he could have. It's just one of those injuries. You know how this goes with athletes. If it's hamstring, calf, groin, one of those core injuries, they never really heal. Yeah. So it's more just about how can you manage this thing? And I'm yeah. sure that's how it was. He probably could have played in that series. And they were like, eh, we don't really need you until we need, we you. need you. And if it's one of those injuries, yeah. let's just get you as rested as possible. And then we'll unleash you in game one. Yeah. And, you know, I think you'll hear you could see it like Lucas fighting through. Yep, They have right. no chance yeah, without yeah. him. You're so correct. he has to play. But. <laughs> His knees messed up. You'll see uh-huh. times he's kind of strolling down the court. I think his shoulders messed up. Yeah. And then, you know, he he plays hard, so he goes he goes down a lot. Right. So it's gonna be attrition on him on him too. And, you know, it's hard to make, you know, conclusions after one game in any series, but this one looks over. <laughs> I mean, it just so looks over. Like, will they win a game or two in Dallas? Yeah, maybe. I think so. Sure. Like, they gotta win one or two. They yeah, the two Luke will probably score 40 in some game. Right. And, you know, and then they'll probably win. And I Kyrie going six of twenty one or whatever it was probably won't happen again. So the games will probably be closer, but they got no answer for that three point shooting that that uh right. Boston has. Who are they doubling? They can't double anybody. Mm-hmm. They got all now they got Porzingis who can handle the ball, faces people up. And the worst part about it is they have nobody who can guard him. They multiple times had guys who were like seven inches shorter than him, and he just faced them up, looked at them, <laughs> smiled at them, and hit a jumper in their face. And then he's, if he's gonna hit 30 foot threes, you're done. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Like he's the original Wembenyama. Well, really. Like well, he re- he he was supposed to be that. And in his rookie year, he was that. Yeah. Then he had, I think he was immature. He's just, well, he's that, and he's got hurt. He got hurt. He a was lot. immature. Remember, there was a lot going on with him yeah. off the court, but he was very young. He even admitted, like, it was a new country. You know, it was a lot going sure. on, and it's New York. So that's a very tough place to go to. And then he got hurt. And it took him three years right. to get over all the knee stuff. And look, like, <laughs> Brad Stevens got a steal in that. Oh, I mean, it, like, yeah. go look at that trade now. It looks ridiculous now that they have him. And they really didn't give up very much to get it. No. I mean, I get they gave up Marcus Smart, who was kind of heart and soul of them, but their defense is just fine without well, yeah, Marcus no, Smart. So, <laughs> He's so, totally just fine without so, him. So that's what I was going to say, too, with Dallas. Dallas can't rely on, oh, there'll be a night where both Luka and Kyrie go off. Their defense is too good on that I side know. that one of them will be locked in. They might let one of them go off on a game, but you're not going to get the game where, what was it in Minnesota? What was it, game seven? They both had like 37, 38 points. Like, yeah. You're not getting that this series. Boston's no. defense is far too good. They're too good. And even their role guys like become a problem. Yeah. yeah. Like, you know, White's a problem yep. for them. They don't like they, they just they're not gonna have an answer for this. I think Jason Kidd's a very good coach. I think Luke is amazing. I think Kyrie will be a lot better than he was last night. Sure. But them winning four games against them feels very far fetched <laughs> yeah. at this point. Like really far fetched. Like, is this gonna be a sweep? Probably not. But like Celtics in five or six. I mean, like it doesn't, it's not even going to get extended to seven. Like they, they can't, they can't play with them. And I think that that's pretty obvious now. I have to, I have to uh, hat tip Tim Murray. I did take his bet of Celtics one and a half games spread. One and a half games. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I feel really good about after short of (laughs) short of injuries. Yes. And I thought really the most the telling thing was, I still think Jalen Brown's the best player on the court, Mm -hmm. actually. Like, well, no, maybe Luke is. But like Luke is Luke is the most indefensible player because he can do things that yeah, no one else. Yeah, he can yeah, hit yeah. shots from all angles and you know like so he's the most. But for the Celtics, it's really Brown. Like there's really it, I still feel like in the end he's probably going to get the MVP, especially if this is Tatum. I'm sure his numbers were fine. You know I'm sure they were good. But like, did you feel like he had a major effect and they won going away? Like it was almost like they didn't even need to make him a focal point at all. And that's what's really scary about them. Like he played off the ball so many times. They didn't even need him to be like a dominant player to win easily last night.
11 rebounds, 5 assists, 16 points, but he played 42 minutes. He was the ultimate. Right. Well, How many shots did he take? Uh, I, it's not on this one, but I'll, I'll look it up for you. Yeah. I, like, I don't rec- – like, I was watching, and I'm like, they're not even running the ball through him. Like, they don't even need to. Like, he got the like, – a couple times late in shot clocks, he got it, and he put up shots. He either made him or he missed them. He got a couple open looks from three, drains them every time. But, like, they didn't need to run anything through him. They didn't have to try to isolate him. They didn't have to – so their so-called best player is it necessary to run an offense through to beat them going away? Forget it. Like just forget it. Like there's there's no shot here. No he, shot. He attempted sixteen. Sixteen shots. Yeah, six for sixteen. Okay, so that's more than I thought he did. Yeah, it was a quiet. It, yeah. it was really really quiet for him. They don't need him. He wasn't. He wasn't the leading shot taker, right? Uh, no. Who was it? Uh, it Brown? was. Hold on, I'm just going through. Ah, uh, Porzingis. Porzingis was. Porzingis. Yeah. Porzingis. Oh, no, so, uh, he shot more. Tatum, or yeah, Tatum shot actually shot more from three pointer. So actually, yes, from three, it was. sure. Yeah, yeah. But from three, but overall, yeah. shot overall attempts. Overall, goals was six. He, yeah, he was six of sixteen. He shot the most. And, the, yeah. and he shot the most. He had the yeah. most shots. Yeah. Sixteen sh- attempts yeah. was the most yeah. shots. And then Porzingis had thirteen. And what did Brown have? Last Brown night? was seven for twelve. I mean, just think about that for a second. Yeah. They don't need any of these guys to be high volume shooters, and they could have Jason Tatum go six of 16 and win going away. They don't have to run the offense through him at all. They can isolate him anytime they want. They didn't have to, they didn't even really have to do much of that. That was a cakewalk. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what Dallas is going to do about it. Like, sometimes you just go, well, that's game one, whatever. Like, there will be an adjustment. And I don't think they'll get blown out every night. I think Luka and Kyrie are too good for that to happen. But I don't see the path at uh, all. I just don't even see it. I don't even see I, I, I don't even see that. And then even, you know, let's say they kick it back to Dallas and they win one or even two. That Boston crowd was relentless, too. Yeah, it was no. the fourth quarter. They were blowing them out, and no. they were still booing Kyrie at every opportunity. They were still loud at every single shot. Yes. Like, I get it. It's the finals. But not every... Not every fan base stays alive when they're winning by 25 points in the fourth quarter. So. The adjustment they have to make is, they, it's crazy, but they have to double Porzingis. So <laughs> good luck with that. Good luck with that. Yeah, so right. he probably won't get as many looks in the next game for however many minutes he plays. But when you're doubling him and you've got Brown on one side of the court and Tatum on the other, and they've got one-on-one the second the ball is swung to them, good luck with that. Right. They're they're too they're too deep they're too diverse their role players hit too many threes and I felt like from the get go that Holiday on Irving was going to be the big deal Holiday's a great great defensive player if he just limits him which happened last night forget it like they don't have enough volume scorers around Luca to overcome it and then if they're going to shoot like they did for that period of time in the first quarter into the early second then it's over, over. They can't withstand anything like that. That was an avalanche mm-hmm. that hit them last night. So, And th- that was one of the, that six, seven-minute period, like once he came in, when Porzingis came in and he just started hitting people, like shots in people's faces, I went, oh, this is over. Yeah. And it's an NBA game. You never think any of them are over, but even at halftime, I'm like, they're not coming back. No, they're there's no not. way. No, they're not. It's the same thing. No. It's the Celtics defense is, is yeah. the difference maker in this whole series. That's why yeah. everyone says their roster is better overall. It's because they actually yes. swarm you on defense. Like, I think it was more that it took till the second quarter to get one of those avalanches like you just what like you just said when they would miss a shot and then they'd go right down and score or get the turnover on the inbounds like yes. ooh, i was like it took two quarters for them to start doing this to them like yes. oh god like <laughs> it also felt like they've heard it for like 10 days going <laughs> we've lost two games in the playoffs right. and you guys keep making up this idea that we've gotten lucky yeah. or we're just not that good they had the best record they were showing things like They've won more games by 20 plus points than any team in yeah. like the last 50 years. Like they're really, really good. Everyone's looking for a problem with them because they haven't gotten over the hump. It's happening yeah. this year. It's well, happening. I hate to, uh, you know, like blame the media on one, but you never want the discussion to get to the point where the overall favor from the beginning of the I season know. starts to feel like the underdog. Like, was, that's what, that's what, that's what, that's why they came out like that. I you think you got to stop going, talking about yeah, it. Cause they're going, wow. Yeah. I thought we were the best team in the league. Yeah. And all of a sudden we have all this billboard material and you're treating us like oh, equal. It's like 60 <laughs> plus wins. Didn't do it for right. you. Okay. Uh, losing two games in three series didn't do it for you okay guys oh we're going against yeah. the six seed in the west oh, yeah. oh, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. oh, oh they're gonna beat us oh okay got it right. vegas is on it though yeah vegas yeah. has them as prohibitive favorites i remember even like right before the indiana series started the way indiana won against new york i'm like you know what like 
I think this is going to be tougher. But I remember turning by the end of the week going, because everyone else had, was like waiting for yeah. who's going to beat Boston. I'm like, I don't think so. Now, I didn't see Halliburton getting hurt. But I'm like, yeah, I don't think so, guys. Give me Boston at five or six. And now it's it's a freight train. Well, that, that it's is- a freight train. They're not getting beaten here. And they're a juggernaut because that whole team is under contract and they're coming back. Yes, and so right. they're a juggernaut. Well, their uh, 1.1 was on that Indiana, uh, Indiana series. That reminded me of Caps Vegas. Like, Indiana did everything they could in game one, and they still took it to overtime. And yes. Boston still won. It still was like, won. all right, like, you guys are done because yeah. you took that effort. At least effort. Indiana's got a deep team who can score. Yeah, yeah. And so that's why I'm like, I think that's why a lot of people were like, you know what? Like, there's there's some pluckiness there. I don't think Dallas can do this Correct. unless Luca has, you know, and he's probably capable of it because he's an all-timer. He'll have some game where he scores 20 straight points or something like right. that, like takes over a game because he has to because he's not going to pass it to Gafford. Right. Correct. Exactly. They don't have five scores on the court. Boston does. Yeah. That's there's the other problem. Boston has five scores on the court. All of them can shoot threes. Dallas does not. Yep. Dallas at any point in time has really good big men defensively but not guys that can score. Mm -hmm. So it's going to fall on Luka and Kyrie. Kyrie's going to have to be way better than he was, and I'm not sure that he can be because Holiday's a problem for them. This is this is you, five or six tops. I mean, that's all it is. To your point, yeah. too, on that, on them going to roll for like a couple years here, yeah, I said this yesterday on my show because all we've heard with Brown is, oh, like first seven years, it's been really good, but you haven't been able to get over the big one. Like, yeah. And once he does, you know how this works, especially yes. in the NBA. When they get one, they start playing completely more free, and it's about to happen next year. I mean, Milwaukee seems to be not able to figure out what should be around Giannis. Right. You have so, no idea what that team's going to be next year. I'm waiting for a Woj bomb that Dame's out of there. Yeah, correct. Yep. I'm waiting for that. Mm-hmm. And then Philadelphia, I think, has been a little unlucky with some of the things. You right. know, And MB getting hurt kills them. Right. Um, they're they're at a crossroads. They're right? at a crossroads. But if they can get, if they can, and Maury's been able to do it in the past, if he's able to get the third star again, like let's say they get Paul George with Maxi and Embiid, well, they'll be formidable again. Yeah. So they're the ones that like stand to get better. And Indiana, off of this experience, if they could get one more guy to come in there, might be really good. But everyone else, short of some like major Woj bomb moves, the East feels like it's theirs. And if Philadelphia makes the right move, maybe they're hanging with them. But it doesn't. There's no one else tracking towards anything right. near them. And the West is, you know, the West. The bloodbath. It is. It's a bloodbath. <laughs> but I, I mean, now it's like, do some of these stars look at the East and go, "Let's oh, get I've, out of this." I've been calling like, this enough for a while. of this. Let's get out of this. I think someone from the Suns is getting traded East. I think someone. Maybe. I think there's a Lakers trade to the East. I don't know well, who it lucky. is. Maybe someone in the East would want Beal off their hands. I mean, they might get lucky. I don't know about that one. I know. Chief, I know but. <laughs> but, I'm, you know, on a good, good team where he's the third piece, like right. that's a different story. Well, with him. I've always felt that well, way. Well, does with him. Brad want to go? Because no trade clause <laughs> play. Oh, that's right. No trade clause. I don't want to play for Milwaukee. He ain't going to Milwaukee. <laughs> no. Uh, today, supposedly, too, Dan Hurley is meeting with the Lakers. There you go. Magic Johnson already rubber stamped it and yeah. said he's very excited and likes it. <laughs> Gotta love Magic. Yeah. He's already, he's basically said this is probably going to happen. And considering Hurley's made no noise about how he's not going to do this and UConn will not be able to compete with whatever the offer is. It sounds like that's happening, and we'll, they'll probably the NBA is going to ask them nicely to wait until after the finals is over because it will trump all the news. So I think they'll, in a week, Dan Hurley is going to leave right. UConn, which for college basketball is great. It opens up the landscape a little bit more because they've been ridiculously dominant sure. in that. Yeah. All right, let me take a quick break. Brain Blast is Joey Spence, 630 Sports Capital. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Pretty good. You- Match the tone. Hi, right everyone. Come to my game tonight. No games this weekend. Huh? No games this weekend. Yeah, but he's got yes, a good one tonight. Yes, today. Yeah, he's got a good one tonight. Had a good one last night, a good one tonight. If you're into, this feels actually old bullets, Lay Boule. Promote the other team's players <laughs> that are coming to play your team. <laughs> well, I mean. This is it, the old school when they had. The, the uh, posters were Manute Bowl and Muggsy yeah. Bogues, tallest and shortest players in league, and they're facing Larry Bird. Like, it was like one of those things. <laughs> to like, be fair, yeah. this was a little different. Like, I will give them the benefit yeah. here. These are the two stars that everyone knows yes. if you're just jumping into the league. So, yes. yeah, I'll give them a little bit of a pass on uh, this one. Let's go in order. I mentioned this yesterday. We didn't talk about it, but apparently somebody went up to the Sky players, yeah. not yesterday, the day before, day before when they got yeah. to D.C., whatever hotel they were staying at. And some man came up and 
was like with a phone and just started what they're describing as harassing Kennedy Carter and other members of the sky. This right. is also off of what happened um, at the Sky Fever game last week that started what was an entire week of a news cycle for the WNBA, unlike any WNBA news cycle that I can ever remember Right for right. them. Like, they... <laughs> it's so crazy. Like, the Aces, who are the champions, have the best player in the league, mm-hmm. who just, like, broke a record for, like, best stat line ever, and it's just a nothing burger. <laughs> comparatively to what's going on with the two rookies that came right. in, the other rookie class that came in and all the popularity that has. And so somebody came up to them and it was described by the GM of the team as it, it ended as fast as it started and the police didn't have to get involved and everybody thanked their team security for making the best of a bad situation. Um, I, like everybody, have a lot of questions about what's going on Mm -hmm. and did not like what I saw last week. And I'm not saying, like, you should just let Caitlin Clark make threes because it makes everybody happy. But you also don't need to Jeff Galuli her, Mm -hmm. you know, like, because that doesn't seem to jive. And that's why I think everybody's trying to figure out what is going on here because she's being targeted. Even Gino Ariema said it yesterday. I actually felt better when I heard him Mm -hmm. say it. He goes, she's getting targeted. And, 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 you know, he even admitted, he's like, Rookies have to pay their price to get into a league, any league, but she's getting targeted. And I think that's where everybody's trying to figure out what's going on here. Um, and so I, I like, I want to say in defense of the sky, don't do that. Like right. fans, come on. Yeah. yeah. Like it, it, you're not in charge of sending a message for everybody else. They've heard enough this week. I think the message is getting across. I thought Angel Reese, I, I felt this was not a coincidence that the referees blew some technical fouls on her very quickly when maybe she wasn't deserving of them in the game before the Mystics game. And I think part of it feels like it's too much of a coincidence, not that the referees weren't like, you need to get control of that team because sure. we don't like what happened the other day, right? And then, um, who was it? Here is Brianna Turner, who plays for them, but wasn't there. I guess she, she maybe she's injured, whatever. She wrote this about this interaction. She says, I wasn't present for the interaction from earlier, but what occurred is unacceptable. I didn't realize that when we said grow the game, that that would be interpreted as harassing players at hotels. You're free to have your own opinion, but consider if this happened to you or someone you know. Yes, we thankfully travel with security, but the absurd headlines recently have certainly created an unstable environment for our safety. I've been called every racial slur imaginable lately, and my teammates and I have had it even worse. Uh, And my teammates have had it even worse. Okay, on two parts of that. One, uh, three parts of it. One, it is completely unacceptable. Mm -hmm. This is sports. That was a hard foul that shouldn't have happened. It should have been adjudicated differently. It does feel very targeted, and I don't really understand it because Caitlin Clark, whether you like this or not, whether it's jealousy or whatever it is, the reality is a lot of eyeballs are on this league because of her. Sorry, Angel. That's just the truth. Like, that's the reality of it. The exponential change in attendance has to do with her coming into the league. I don't know why, but that's the reality. And so, therefore, people are paying attention. I agree with Brianna Turner and her teammates that while I'm questioning what the Sky were doing the other day and I'm questioning how the league is handling this whole thing, but I would never <laughs> say corporal justice should happen in anything in sports. It's ridiculous. Of so she's right. totally right about that. On the third part of this, I've been called every racial slur imaginable. Again, people, grow up. Mm-hmm. Like, come on. Where, where are we? Cut it out. It's ridiculous. That's stupid. And I'm on her side, too. But on the, but the absurd headlines recently have certainly created an unstable environment for our safety. What's absurd about the headlines? I mean, what's absurd about the headlines that people are asking, is she being targeted and for what reason? And nobody seems to want to give an answer that makes any sense at all. I do think I, I and I've saying this all week context was lost in that one game. They were going at each other. We've seen a million sporting events where both teams lose their minds for a collective amount of time. I'm not disagreeing with you that Caitlin Clark seems a little bit more targeted. But as I said on that game too, Carter was called for a flagrant foul the next day. 
in almost any other sport, we're moving on. We're moving on to the next one. Yeah. And instead, it, the, this is a first for the league getting everybody talking about correct. it. A block on first take. Yes. Exactly. McAfee saying crazy stuff he has to apologize <laughs> right. for. Like, yes. yeah, like, like we were talking about the other day, there are seven conversations going on, and most of them don't really apply to what actually happened. This is just new for everybody, yeah, yeah, and we're right. all kind of confused about what's going on. Exactly. And so, what but I, I don't think the headlines are absurd. I think the questions should be asked. And this is what comes with heightened attention to your league. Don't you want that? Well, when some, when I've seen a million crazy things happen in NBA games, still, we had to have a long conversation for three days about Draymond, Clark, uh, Draymond Green when he's choking people. Well, I think the difference here, though, too, though, is she's saying, oh, some of the headlines, but... Here's the problem. We all only see the headlines that we see. And on this topic, there are ridiculous sides from both ends of the spectrum. So okay. I'm going to guess like that you can misconstrue that any way you want. But I think there are people that saying she needs to be protected and that the league should, you know, help her out more than the other people. Like people are writing that because we're just getting every end of the opinion. Or the spectrum. league should adjudicate these things a little differently because more eyes are on you. And so maybe you should, I don't know, not let things get to a heightened place. Blow sure. the whistles a little sooner. But what I'm, what I'm getting at is the headlines are all over the place. So you actually like this. What I'm getting at is I think we're in it's like a political realm here. We don't know what silo each one of us is getting into every That's single right. day. So I think we're, we're all seeing different viewpoints of this and we're seeing the most extreme headlines versus the not so extreme headlines so much to the point i think it was i want to say it was the chicago tribune or another newspaper in chicago where somebody wrote an opinion piece that wasn't in the sports department and the sports editor had to go out of their way and go i just want to let you know we didn't approve this in the sports side i didn't edit this and we're, oh. we're highly disappointed that someone went and kind of inserted their opinion on something that they're not supposed to really write about like we're getting to the point where that stuff is happening and it's going past the sports page. You're going to get some extreme opinions from people that frankly don't know what they're talking okay. about. I, uh, okay. All right. I, and I agree with that. I, I did feel, though, that most of the rational questions that sure. were being asked were fair. Sure. And you have wanted the attention on the league. You have it now. There's good and bad that comes with that. Yeah. Right. 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 Like you all have been screaming. We've been here the whole time. What are you waiting for? You've been missing the boat. Well, we're finally all paying attention. And for a lot of us, that it is new to a lot of us paying attention like this, that wasn't pretty. Right, right. So we're going to start asking questions about what in the world is going on here. Mm -hmm. Okay. As for C Caitlin Clark, she plays the Mystics tonight. Sky beat the Mystics last night. Yes. They haven't won a game yet. Correct. There's quite a back-to-back -back they've had. Sky, Fever, Caitlin Clark is here. So today, she was asked about it. I guess this is from... Uh, pre-game warm-ups, yep. um, and she was asked about, is she paying attention to what's going on? And this is what she said. Caitlin, as you might be aware, there's been some controversy and conversation over the last few days about everything that happened in the Chicago game. I'm curious how much you pay attention to that, if at all, and what your thoughts are, uh, what your take on that is. Yeah, I mean, I'm not on social media, so I don't see a lot of it, but you would be surprised. Like, I still have my TV on in my house, and, like, I'm watching sports. Like, you know, you're still aware of it, and you still see it, um, you know, but... Other than that, like my focus is basketball. It's it sometimes it stinks how much you know the conversation is outside of basketball and not the product on the floor and the amazing players that are on the floor and how good they are for their teams and how great this season has been for women's basketball going from college basketball to now the WNBA. Some of the crowds are you know unprecedented and had never been seen before. The viewership's amazing, um, but yeah, I mean I try to block it out. Um, you know I don't have social media on my phone. Like I don't go on it. I don't see a lot of it. You know. Um, but I don't really think it's that different from, you know, when I was in college, like everybody's gonna have their opinion. Everybody's entitled to their own opinion. Um, uh, that's just what, what it is. And, um, I think you just got to be focused on what's in your locker room, what's in your organization, um, how your teammates feel, how your coaches feel. Um, and for me, like that's my focus, but also like I have a job to do at the same time. So, um, you know, that's where my focus remains. Okay. Uh, that's Caitlin Cousins, Senator Cousins. <laughs> How Caitlin diplomatic Cousins. was that one? <laughs> well, boy, does she know how to take the high road early. Correct. Right. She's just, As I you know you. what? You all have your opinions. You know, I'll see some of them. I won't see most of them. I kind of don't care. And uh, I'm here to grow the game and play basketball, you know, 
don't at me. As I told you, too, that is a part of the problem in all of this, too, is that she does do that. I'm not saying it's wrong, but you and I know how. I think that's the right way to treat it, honestly. Sure, but she also. what is she supposed to say here? Well, I mean. She she, she addressed it in the moment. She said that's not a basketball play, which was about as firm as she's been about really anything. Right, but also at the same time, it's like dealing with the mob. Is she going to say the league is targeting me? No, she can't. And as far as she, if she doesn't stand up for herself, well, things like that are going to keep happening, too. So. She's in a damned if you do, damned if you don't scenario, That's I think, right. there. So, I, I, mean, I think she did the right thing by just kind of staying at Yeah, it. yeah. There's there's nothing else she could do. I mean, because, like I said, she goes, if she all of a sudden she starts whining a little bit, those players are going to go after her even more. That's I mean, right. we know how sports works. Like, That's right. exploit every single weakness you can find. That yeah. would be one of them. Yeah. Senator Cousins. Senator Clark. Senator Clark. So we got Senator Clark. It. for uh, Senator Cousins is in Georgia now. <laughs> That's right. Senator Clark. We had Ambassador Zimmerman here for a while. <laughs> Some people know how to handle this stuff and, like, again, and maybe that infuriates her rivals even more <laughs> that she doesn't delve maybe. into all of it. It might. Because they're the ones having to answer these questions, and then she gets asked about what they said or did, and she just goes, high road. Right. I would be interested in 10 games if this is still happening, that if she doesn't go into a locker room and goes, guys, yeah. <laughs> anyone going to help me out here? Because yeah. I think that's actually still the biggest point of all of this is I where mean, her teammates. I'm interested to see what the scene is tonight. I mean, you know, the second time she's been here, she came and played against Maryland, mm-hmm. you know, with Iowa. And she actually, I think she broke the record, wasn't it? No, no it wasn't in that one. No, but she hit a logo. I remember she hit a logo yes. shot there. But there yeah, was... Yeah. There were there were people lined up for an hour to try to get into College Park in the arena to see her. Um, I'm assuming the game is sold out tonight, and yeah. I saw the secondary market is not cheap to yep. get in. Mm-hmm. So I'll be interested to see what the scene is tonight for yeah. her I against mean, the winless Washington Mystics this <laughs> evening. I mean, last night was pretty good. I don't think they got into the upper level for Chicago, but it was still mostly full lower level club level. It's pretty good mm-hmm. for you know for any game that they get back to I cap agree. one for. So tonight, yeah. I think they opened up the entire arena, and that's what the second market is. They should. Yeah, Yeah, they should. It's always by demand, too, because I think Mm -hmm. Chicago, there wasn't as much of a demand, so they didn't open the upper Well, they they, they immediately, everybody did this. Everybody who was in a smaller arena immediately opened up a bigger arena if they could for her because they knew the tickets would sell out overnight, and they did. And then they announced a couple days later, oh, we'll do the Sky 2. And, you know, sorry, Angel, but... (laughs) You don't sell as many well, tickets. On that you know, front, like that seems to bother her on some level, but you don't. On you that know. front, too, that was convenient for the Mystics, too. Yeah. Like, let's set up the court the night before anyways. Yeah. That it's worked back out. To back. It's yes. back to back. I'll be interested to see what the scene is. I'll be very interested to see what that yeah. scene is. All right, we'll take a quick break. Gabby Carl from the Spirit's going to join us next as they get set to get back to action this weekend against Utah tomorrow night. Bram Washington Show, ESPN 630, the Sports Capital. Back to the voice of the Burgundy and Gold, Bram Weinstein. On ESPN 630, the sports capital. Uh, The Spirit will be back in action tomorrow night. They're going to be at Utah. We'll have the call of that. Uh, 730 is kickoff time for that. That'll be post the Orioles-Tampa Bay Rays game tomorrow night. Spirit are red hot. Utah is the worst team in the league in terms of goals scored and total points. They have six goals. And the Spirit have seven in the last two first halves of games that they've played. (laughs) And I'll tell you a little bit about it after you hear from Gabby Carl, the defender who was on international break. We talked a lot about the six U.S. national team members of the Spirit that were practicing last week. Gabby Carl is a longtime uh, player for the Canadian national team. She was also with her national team last week. So I caught up with her as we get set for the Spirit season to resume. So the Spirit are off of the international break, back in action this weekend against the Utah Royals as we are joined by defender Gabby Carl. Hey, Gabby, how are you? Hey, good, how are you? It's been an interesting week. Uh, So you and many of your teammates, of course, went on the international break. Um, We obviously around here focus a lot on the U.S. women's national team. You're part of the Canadian national team. Um, What is your experience like playing for your home country? Uh, yeah, obviously it's an honor. It's something I've been doing for almost 10 years now, which is absolutely crazy, but it, it never gets old, like old. Every time I put the jersey on, the crest on, it's the absolute honor. Um, so for some of your teammates, specifically a couple of rookies, they had their first opportunity to get national team experience. Um, can you remember back? It's been a long time for you, but can you remember back to what that feeling was like to take part for your national team for the first time? Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, honestly, so stressful, you know, <laughs> uh, that first time it's just, you want to do so well, but it's also just so exciting. There's just so many high emotion from getting that first camp, that first cap, everything. 
uh, and you can just like kind of see your future and how it's going to be. Maybe it's the biggest opportunity ever. Uh, so it was just really exciting to see them get that opportunity. Okay. Can you take me through the last, you know, week and a half, two weeks. So the team's playing really well, the spirit, and then all of a sudden here's this break and then players kind of go off on their own and now they regroup again. Um, what's that week like for the team as you kind of try to just get back on track together? For sure. It's always interesting because we all go in our different environments, but I think in great environments to improve. Um, and so like the girls that are in Virginia are training hard and we're also training hard respectively and so then when we come back together it's just a matter of having a few meetings to get everything back together a few trainings but it usually comes back together pretty nicely yeah and this was interesting you went back to Virginia right where you you were training for a little bit and then some of your teammates didn't come back because you happened to be going out to Utah so this must have been a very interesting week to kind of get everybody back on the same page yeah, for sure. So I uh, I think like a few of the U.S. players that go back to training uh, had a few days there. I flew straight from Toronto to Utah yeah. uh, and met the team uh, yesterday. Uh, so, it, yeah, it is really interesting how the dynamics of this is of this window. But I'm, I'm really not worried about us. I think we're really good at coming back together and and being there. Okay, so let's get into where the spirit are. You guys have played really well lately. You sit where you sit in the table, which is in striking distance of the top spot. What has been the secret over the last month or two to the success of the spirit? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. And I think there's probably multiple factors. Um, I think we have incredible players with enormous talent. But I think what sets us apart is our work ethic and our willingness to keep growing. And wanting to keep growing, I think uh, when you're in the middle of a season, sometimes you can kind of get stuck going through the motions. And I don't think that's what we're doing right now. I think we're really pushing forward and wanting to get better every week. When you say the work ethic stands out to you, can you be specific? Like, what do you see day to day, week to week by this team that that shows you that? Uh, I just think it's the way we train, really. Uh, And I think it doesn't it comes from our staff pushing us and then comes from also the players. Um wanting to be pushed and wanting to get better. Um, I think it's just the way we train and that just like shows that work ethic. And then it goes and carries into the games. So um, I saw a piece that was from a Canadian outlet. It was in French. So it was translated for me. And one of the things that you talked about it, and I was hoping you would touch on, which was the team started slowly. You gave up a penalty kick in 11 seconds into the season. You lost your opener. And then in the second match, you guys got behind very quickly. But it, it sounded like you learned about this team in that second match and how they responded to it and came back. Could, could you kind of touch on the beginning of the season and where you saw where the turnaround started? Absolutely. I think before this season, we all had a sense that we could be a special team, but the reality was we were all kind of new to this. There was a lot of new players and a, a lot of rookies, so we we're a pretty young team. So going into that first game, it was like a, oh, moment where I was like, okay, this this isn't a fairy tale, you know? Um, and then and then we lost that game. And then by the second game, we get scored on first. And then you're thinking, is this going to be our season? But then just seeing the response and everyone's willingness to not give up and like want to go and get that win. Uh, and then getting that win on like a last, complete last minute goal just showed what we're capable of. And so did that, obviously that meant something to you. Did you feel that throughout the locker room? And and did you get the sense that it kind of carried the same weight that you had the feeling about it? Yeah, I believe so. I think you could just see a shift in energy in the team Uh, after the game in the locker room. There was just, I think we always believe, but then once, once you have proof, there's just like this absolute belief that, okay, we can do this. Um, interestingly too, it was slow starts at the early of the season that, that seemed to be part of the issue with the early matches and now, and this is partially because of the last two matches, but the spirit have scored 16 first half goals. That's the most by any team in any half in the league. And lately it's seven in the last two matches in the wins over Seattle and angel city. Uh, boy, the starts have really changed. Like, Could you kind of talk about why this team is starting better recently? I think it goes back again to training. Um, It's a reality that happened that we were getting scored on 
early on a lot. And that's something we addressed uh, as a team. And then going out and training in a way that's like, okay, we from the, we, from the second we step on that field, at training even, we have to be like on. We have to be ready. We have to be mentally prepared. We have to go into tackles. We have to do everything we need to do so that when we are on the field for a game, it's that same mentality of like once the like whistle blows, it's game on. All right. Last thing, you're playing Utah um, this weekend. Obviously, they're struggling. They're struggling to score. Um, I, obviously, you can't take anybody lightly. Um, how are you guys thinking about this match this weekend? Yeah, as you said, um, this is the NWSL. You can't take anyone for granted. Um, so I think we're addressing it the same way we address any other team, which is with respect. And we're taking our game plan seriously and Obviously, we scouted them and everything, and and so now it's just yeah, it's just about delivering on the field. All right, good luck this weekend. We look forward to seeing you back in Virginia and back at home next week. Gabby Carl, thank you so much. Thank you very much. All right, that's Gabby Carl. Uh, I'll give you a couple minutes on that match. We'll be calling it obviously tomorrow night. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're playing in Utah. Utah, they beat them two to one first meeting, um, but that feels like eons ago. Uh, Utah is an expansion team. If that may, doesn't make any sense to you, yes, they were Utah once. Then they went to Kansas City, and then they got this team, and it's an expansion team. They have a lot of rookies. They had the. This is a, an interesting matchup because four of the top five draft picks are on these two teams. Yep. Uh, five of the top seven are on these two teams, so they're very young. But Utah has six goals the whole year, and the last two matches they played really good sides. Kansas City and North Carolina. And when I tell you that they could have lost those matches seven to nothing. Oh no. <laughs> they could have. Got it. In fact, the two matches ago when they played North Carolina, in the first half, North Carolina had something like twenty touches in the box and Utah had none. Wow. Like they didn't even come close to actually scoring. And they lost both of these matches. They've been shut out six times. Um, <laughs> the Spirit kind of have to win. This is, they're, they're, they're having trouble. This is and, the second game in a row where it's a, uh, as we like to call, an auto-win game. Yes. They auto-win this. But even in that Seattle game a couple weeks ago, they only won three to two. The Spirit did. That's right. And you and I were even kind of looking at each other at the end of that game like. I don't know. Should have been a little, you know, a little more of a runaway. Yes. Uh, in this case, too, like in the last match, they lost one nothing to Kansas City. Mm-hmm. Uh, the goal came early in the second half. In the first half, Kansas City had what they called seven big chances, hit a crossbar. Somebody for Utah somehow headed away a goal that was heading into an open net. <laughs> uh, their best striker literally missed two wide open nets like it should have been five nothing at half so this one feels like a and i know it's been a weird week but it's a weird week for everybody um they should win yeah so i'm expecting a win and if if utah scores twice on them that's a humongous disappointment right humongous yeah all right so we'll see what happens tomorrow night you can catch that a uh, 7 30 kickoff uh, Gabby Vincent, Mike Minnick, and myself will be calling the match for you, Spirit and Utah. Take a quick break. John Kimes next. Brain Watch the Show, he's paying 630 Sports Capital. All right, next week, the uh, Commanders are going to have two, maybe three, but likely just two, what they're calling mandatory minicamp practices where everybody has to show up. Fortunately for them, you know, that's somewhat different from some of the other teams around the league. Everybody has showed up for everything so far with the OTAs, and they had what I thought, and I talked about this on Wednesday, the most spirited practice that I'd seen um, of the summer because we saw some 11 on 11 for the first time. Granted, you know, you can't hit anybody and it's non-contact and all that stuff, but you know, some more hints of what's coming down the road was there. And there's a lot of enthusiasm, you know, with what's going on on the field as we welcome in John Kime from ESPN, the John Kime Report. And, you know, I mean, I would expect enthusiasm, new coaches, the new GMs bringing a lot of, you know, a lot of enthusiasm. The fans are into it. Um, Jaden Daniels can bring a lot of enthusiasm because that's very different. But I was like thinking back to last year and there was a similar amount of enthusiasm because the new owners had come in and not all the changes had happened, but the new owners had come. And you remember the training camp crowds were robust. They were into right. it. But the energy on the field didn't match what was happening on the sideline. And this year, 
what I'm seeing is the energy on the field looks like it's going to match the enthusiasm of the fan base, whether it's warranted or not, but it feels that way to me this time. Yeah, for sure. And I think, I mean, obviously, like you said, the ownership stuff was a big deal last year. And the guy, it's funny because the people who got the biggest cheers when they would walk through the, like the line of crowds to practice be Josh Harris, Eric Bieniemy, and Sam Howell. So two of those guys are gone now. Um, but there was some, there was mystery surrounding Sam for sure. I think there was definitely some, you know, at least a belief by some that maybe the enemy could inject that sort of um, energy into the team, into the offense in a, in a different way. But the dude has a lot of passion, whatever you want to say, he's got a lot of passion for the game, but that didn't work. The other thing, Bram too, a big difference is not just change. Okay. We've got the new owner, but it's also you hired Dan Quinn. Dan Quinn's an energetic guy who also looks for energetic people. I think that was one of the things with the staff the last couple of years. You just didn't have a lot of energy overall in the staff. And, you know, for whatever reason, I mean, some of it's just the kind of guy, you know, who, who you're hiring. And um, this Dan Quinn, I think it's like, I want to say it's like 13 former players are on his coaching staff. I think that leads to a natural energy. Guys like Ken Norton, Daryl Tapp. And I think they bring a different level of energy than most guys would um, or co- assistant coaches would. So that all helps as well. And then, then you get guys who are good talkers. And I don't mean like, you know, trash talk, but like very communicative and, you know, chatty, whether it's Bobby Wagner or guys like Jeremy Chin, you know, Jaden Daniels, a very upbeat guy. So I think there's a lot of new energy for a lot of reasons. Now, what this means in the fall, who the hell knows? But we do know, and, you know, like, it's funny, Brand, because you know this, like, if you say so-and-so has looked good this spring, some people take it to mean so-and-so is going to be a pro bowler this year. Like, all we know is that this spring they look good. But th- so those are, you can sometimes have false, um, you know, um, visions of what somebody might become based on the spring or even training camp. But this part I can say is real. Like, there's definitely better enthusiasm. I don't, we don't know what it'll mean for the season, but there's definitely better enthusiasm. Yeah. I, like last year, um, and this became, in hindsight, it was, it's now obvious, but there was a growing disconnect very early between what the staff yeah. was trying to get the players to do, and it manifested in a really bad way early in the season, and then the season cratered. Um, I don't yeah. feel that at all. Like it feels yeah. like there is a buy-in now it's June and it is all new and there's a lot of really good energy. And I agree with you. We don't know until they lose to somebody, how they're going to really react. Uh, but the buy-in at least verbally and what you see on the field feels like everybody's on the same page and buying into what they're trying to do here. Yeah. And for sure that listen, and the guys who are turning on defense, I think they, they welcomed just new voices and change. So I think there's going to be an automatic buy-in. Plus you have got a guy in Dan Quinn who has built good defenses in the past. I mean, in Seattle and in Dallas, I will say in Atlanta, it was, they, they did not have great defenses. There are a couple of reasons for it, but the bottom line is they weren't. And, um, but but for the most part, he has a really good reputation. And then again, and then you bring in guys who I think who can teach positions. Um, but you bring in strong leaders. Like one of the things, it's not like they haven't had leaders on this team before, but you need a couple guys who stand out in that area. And that's where Bobby Wagner comes in. I think he does that for sure. And I think you get guys like Zach Ertz, Austin Eckler, who in a different way are also strong to, or appear to be strong leader. So I think that all helps as well. That helps the buy-in. You've had a lot of guys who have played for, you know, one of the things they valued in free agency was connections to the players. And so, you know, you saw a lot of guys come in from who had connections to this coach or that coach or whatever. It wasn't all coming from one place, but it was coming from, you know, somebody had a connection to this player somewhere. And I think, I think that helps, you know, they can spread the word about what that coach is trying to do. So, I mean, it's all good right now. And again, like how long it lasts, I don't know, but it is, I do think there's that. And I also think that a lot of guys, like you had a lot of guys coming from elsewhere that, 
that leads to some buy-in right away because you're the new guy. You want to, you, you need to come in and impress. I think the guys who have been here are tired of losing, <laughs> you know? And so they, they wanted that change. They need that change. So I think it makes that easier to buy in as well. You know, and the other, the other major difference and I, and we'll see how it plays out is by this time last year. And again, it was a brand new offense that walked in with, you know, not a brand new quarterback, but might as well have been a brand new quarterback. Right. But by this point last year, like I could tell what they were going to do as an offense. Now, I never would have envisioned the pass run ratio that they had or some of the things that went along with it. But it was pretty clear as day to me, like what their offense was going to kind of look like at mm-hmm. this point this year. You got me on Kingsbury and anybody who yeah. is like writing things about, oh, well, they're going to do this or they're going to do that. I don't think they know what they're talking about because no. when I watch no. them, I have not seen the hints of what this offense is really going to look like in September. No, not at all. And the only thing you can do is maybe glean some uh, clues from the past. <clears throat> like what did he like to do in Arizona? Well, and really it's more about like personnel packages, right? Like they use a lot of t- two tight end sets in Arizona. They, um, you know, they, they ran a lot of no huddle. That's the one thing that, like Brian Robinson said, that he felt was going to be more up-tempo, running a lot of no huddle. So those are – but that's a stylistic thing, right? That, and I think people would expect that from his offense, given how much they did it in Arizona. Um, the rest of it, though, is just – you're right, though. Like, we don't know what they're going to look like because you do have Anthony Lynn, who has been a head coach and is in charge of the run game. You have Brian Johnson, who's been an offensive coordinator – and now is in charge of the pass game. How, what is their input going to be? And they, they always talk about having a commander's offense, not a Cliff Kingsbury offense. Well, clearly he's going to use a lot of his principles. You don't, you're not coming here. He wasn't coming here to institute somebody else's principles. He's coming here to do his. But how is that going to be, you know, but how is it going to evolve with the input of others? We don't know. And I'll go back to, you know, and then it's also like, you know, Jaden Daniels is a different quarterback than Kyler Murray. So, you know, like there are different things that he might be able to handle early on that maybe Kyler Murray couldn't. He's, he's a, you know, he's a more pure passer, I think, than, than Kyler. You know, he's taller, he's more of a, he can hang in the pocket a little bit better. But so I think that, that you take all that into account. And then, Bram, you know, I always, I'll go back to 2012. Now, this is a little bit different, but it does show you sometimes what you see in the summer is not what you see in the season. And in 2012, now we did see them with Robert Griffin III running some option, running a little bit, running some pistol. So they introduced it. But the, the focus was on a lot of other things. It was like part of it. So you thought it was going to be part of it, but not like a main thrust, right? And then the season, you know, we don't spend, you know, we watch every, every practice. They have a walkthrough. We're not always seeing that. Um, and then you go for a couple weeks where you're really not watching them you watch 20 minutes of warm-ups, and then you get to the regular season, and my God, did they look different. You know, so you don't know, and I agree with you. And you can, you can guess what it might be based on some clues of the past or what you see, but you're really not going to know. And I think that's to their advantage. Like Joe Witt didn't even want to tell us a few things the other day because he was like, you know, hey, listen, one of the advantages they have is that people aren't quite sure, even though I think there's more um, – knowledge of what they would do based on what they did in Dallas than what Kingsbury might do here with this staff. Okay. Um, you mentioned Jaden Daniels. Um, I'll just give you my quick takeaway of seeing the few practices I've seen so far. And then the other one, which I thought was the most illuminating one, because there were some 11 on 11 that occurred and albeit, you know, with a faux pass rush, he knows he's not getting hit, you know, nobody's going down so that it's all different. But I will say like, I continue to see quick decision making, and you know, is he making the right ones? I, I don't know. I'd have to ask Kingsbury, <laughs> Brian Johnson. Is, is he making right. the right? I don't know. Right. But the decisiveness is a really good sign to me. So, what what is your yeah. what's your just general takeaway of him so far? For sure, I think that's a that's a key. And you know, I've seen other young quarterbacks who come in and maybe even in those seven on seven or those early eleven on elevens are not making quick decisions. Maybe they're having to tuck and run a lot because they hold the ball too long. And by the time they get through the progression, you know, second and third options are, are closed down too. So 
you, you're not seeing that quite as much, not nearly as much as you with, with Daniels. Um, so I think that's a good thing. I think he has a good compact, quick release. When he sees it, he gets rid of it. Yeah, that's all good. His accuracy is pretty good, uh, very good. Um, there are times where you definitely see some indecision. You would expect that. You know, we haven't, like, one thing we haven't seen, Bram, is them incorporating his legs yet into the offense. So that's the other part, you know, going back to your other point, like when, <clears throat> when we're watching him, how is he going to regulate the defense because of the threat of his legs? Like right now, the defense knows he's not going to run. So how does that change what they do against him? Because those, those his legs are special. Um, so, you know, but yes, I've been impressed. You know, the other, so the couple of things that I've been most impressed by, and I always go back to this because, again, we don't know what we're seeing on the field, you know, what's real, what's not, what's going to translate. I do think he's setting, I think he looks like a kid, who, a player who's going to have a good career. Like, I haven't seen anything at all from him that we say, uh-oh, that's not a good sign, you know, or heard anything to that degree. And that's why I go back to that. Like, what you hear about him matches what you're seeing on the field. So you're not seeing the indecision. You're seeing quick decision-making. What does that come from? It co- usually comes from a guy who's prepared. Yes. And so – The work like, ethic's real that, with him. Yeah. Yeah, and, like, that's the thing that, to me, jumps out. Whatever – you know, you can – again, some like, we don't know – when he's sitting back there, we don't know what's his primary read on this play. How did he handle the read and all that? We don't know. We can see the results, but we don't know because unless you're, you, unless you're in those meeting rooms, unless you have the play sheet, play sheet you're not going to know. We just know, oh, he completed the ball on that one. That was a nice throw. But the coaches might look at that and say, you know, that was a you know, good read or a bad read. We don't know. But what we do know is all the other stuff, right? We've heard that from a lot of different people. And their eyes, their eyes, you know, they get smiles on their face when they talk about this, about him. That doesn't always happen. You know, like Sam Howell had a lot of, you know, people who liked him. And there's still people who think the kid can play, myself included. But, you know, there's just something a little bit different with Daniels when they talk about him. It's that combined with the talent. Plus, you know, I mean, I go back to Howell for real quick, but like, Part of the thing that tripped him up was I felt like he did he was not put in a good situation with how much they threw the ball. Yeah, and I think this I think this staff will put I think well they say let's see but they say they're they're going to you know focus a lot a little bit more on the certainly more on the run which will help off you know reduce some of the pressure on him to make all sorts of plays. Yeah, I, I also I, that's why I find it funny too when people like say all these things like oh they're going to run a ton of no huddle and I know B Rob kind of hinted at it. No, they're not. He's a he's a rookie quarterback. Like you can't come to a conclusion like that right now. Like they're not going to put all well, the pressure on the world on him. They're not going to well, do that. The only, thing, the only thing is that sometimes it can also regulate what the defense does, and so sometimes that can actually help him too. And you go back to like the quick stuff. I don't think like you know, and I don't know when I it just I would say this. It'll be more than what they've done. But when I sure. say that, like it, it was like you know. 8% of the time versus 30 some percent for Arizona, you know, is it going to be 30 some percent? I don't know. But when you're, when you're like, you know, you can have no money in the bank and you get a couple hundred dollars, like, Hey, I'm rich. You know, that's, that's kind of how it's right. It's, I don't know that it's, I don't know how much it's going to be. There will be more. And we've seen them work on it. Yeah. Um, they were working on it the other day. And, but I think there are at times, you know, for him, it can also, you know, it can also help, Reg, again, regulate the defense. So now they may have to stay in a certain cover. So if you're able to get them in a certain package, and you you know you can stick with that for a few plays. So I think you'll see it more, certainly more than the past. We're not talking, you know, we're not talking 50 percent of the time. Here, no way. Right? We're just talking more yeah. than what we've seen yes. here in the past. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let me yeah, get to absolutely. a couple of things that actually did stand out to me um, from the other day because they did go 11 on 11, and it was really the first time. And again, no conclusions, just hints. And it really did feel like the first time I was watching something that was akin to a training camp practice. And the thing that really stood out to me was the offensive line. And namely, because, and again, I don't think starters are set on the, on, at left tackle yet. But Trent Scott running out there yeah. as the left tackle next to Allegretti, and then the backup when the twos came out being Brandon Coleman and Lucas getting work behind Wiley as the quote-unquote swing tackle – I thought was notable. So as we kind of move forward into, will they get another tackle post June one? And what's the competition look like if they don't get anybody of note that competes with them? What did you make of that the other day? 
I, yeah, I, I certainly that certainly caught my attention. I think it caught a lot of people's attention. And um, you know, they've been when we've talked about the tackle a competition. Usually, it's Lucas and and um, Coleman, but you you know they would always include Scott in that as well. So it wasn't like they're excluding them. And I you know I think it's going to be rotating guys in and out. Um, I, I still think that what they have to hope is that Coleman in camp looks like a guy that can handle, can ascend to a starting job at some point this season. Cause if he can't, you know, then I think you're going to have some trouble because I think Lucas has been a solid backup swing tackle and he can, he can, he's been a good spot starter. I don't know if you, if you, if you know, if you have to rely on him for more than six, seven games, what happens at that position? Um, and, you know, as we've talked before, like the post June one stuff, like that was a bigger thing in the past because now guys get released. Guys who are prominent, I would say this, guys who would be prominent possibilities would have already been released. Like they don't get released now because they want, teams want to give their guys a chance to catch on. You can also release a guy in May and, and you know, apply it to, you know, qual- you know classify it as a post June one cut. So you just don't see, like the last few years, you don't get a lot of guys that are that level. But, Bram, where it goes to is when cuts are made in August. Like there are a couple teams that have some tackles and now, you know, they drafted guys. There aren't a lot of them where guys might come available. We can say, okay, this guy has been a quality starter. Maybe he can come in here. Or do you wait for a guy like DJ Humphreys who tore his, I think it was tore his ACL on New Year's Eve. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Kingsbury coast from Arizona. So, but like, when the heck would he even be ready? <laughs> we don't know. And like, you know, I get asked about David Bakhtiari a lot. The guy's had played like he's played three he's games in three ball. years. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's it's been bad. So, so there aren't there aren't great options. That's why like it, Coleman really has to come through for them, unless somebody, unless there's like. You know, the Jets have multiple tackles. Maybe there's a guy that may, can you pry someone loose from them. Now, we're looking at Tyron Smith. Morgan Moses up there, but he's been a right tackle, obviously. Um, and they drafted a tackle. Would somebody there be a guy that you could, you know, would yeah, – I, I don't know. I don't know that they would do that because um, from what I've heard up there, they wouldn't. And then there's, you know, is there another team that might have a guy available who could be a – you know, but there's you're not going to get – anything other than a very short-term solution here. I think what this team needs is Coleman to be able to ascend, and we're not going to know that until training camp about where he's at in his development. Yeah. Again, no conclusions, but this was notable, right. and I think it should be pointed it out. It was notable. Yes. And, well, there's, an, there's another thing I think is notable, like when the quote-unquote starters, and I don't think any of them are entrenched, especially at that position, but obviously quarterback – Mariota came out with the ones, if you will, during 11 on 11, which just read to me that while I still think Jaden Daniels is going to win the job, they are going to make him earn it. They haven't handed it to him. And that's how it read to me when I saw that the other day. Yeah, Um, me too. And I like that. And um, and again, Daniels has shown nothing to suggest he wouldn't be ready. Um, But yes, I think they've kind of, they really seem to be going out of their way to reduce the pressure on him to come in right away and serve as the savior or as the face of the franchise, whether it's how they deal with public appearances or things like that. You know, they're really, they're not trying to, I would say this, perhaps two years ago, this guy would have been on the cover of everything That's right. and touted all over the place. To, to help push tickets. They're not, you know, they're not doing anything other than, Hey, you drafted this kid now come in and win the job. And Mariota is a veteran. I mean, we all know like at some point, whether it's August 1st, September 1st, October 1st, that Jaden Daniels will be in there and needs to be in there. Um, but yes, I agree with you. Like I like that. And you know, you go back the last couple of years or a couple of times, like with, with, uh, with Ron Rivera, you know, with Dwayne Haskins as a starter, I think you know, certainly in hindsight, he wishes he had made him earn it more. Yeah. Um, it, it was a bad summer for that because there was, there was COVID and there was no preseason, et cetera. But there was, you know, he, but he, they didn't do that. And then, you know, even last year with Howell. Um, they gave it to they, him too early. <laughs> they, they, they basically did. And, you know, they, there was never, there was a, hey, he's going into offseason as the number one guy. 
And I always felt like sometimes the hope was the guy would come through versus the reality that, that are they truly ready? Now, I wouldn't have had a problem at all if Howell, you know, and I, you know, I think if Howell had merged with the job, because I think for, for that staff, they needed Howell to do well. They weren't going to save their jobs by starting Jacoby Brissett for a lot of the year. They just, you know, it just wasn't going to happen. So um, that, but, but they didn't, you know, but there wasn't a real competition. And I don't know, Bram, that I still think the competition really is between Jaden Daniels and himself. That's right. Because like, once he, once he shows he's ready, but the, but, but to your point though, he's got to show he's ready. He's got to go do the work. And, and I have, I, everything you hear is that he is, but I do like the approach. I, I you know, I do. Cause uh, he, he, I, I just think it's the right one. Okay. Uh, one final position group. I just want to get your opinion on it, which is corner, which feels yeah. very wide open. So, and I, I thought Joe Witt <laughs> said that, yeah, it's one way of putting it. Uh, Joe Witt said the other day, like, don't come at me and ask me who the starters are anywhere. And it, you'll see this. Right. If you watch them, they're mixing and matching all sorts of things now. So I, yeah. like, I'm not really sure what they're doing, but at that position specifically, where there is no quote unquote, number one corner on this roster, what have you seen so far? And what do you make of what feels to be, is going to be a heated competition to get on the field from that position group? <clears throat> Yeah, and that's a, it's really hard to know because yeah, I, when we've been out there a couple of times, like Forbes has worked with the starters and initially and then other times Mike Davis has. You know, St. Juice has been a, a consistent one on the right side. Um, his tape wasn't very good, and I don't, think that it, I don't think they were all that impressed with his tape. But then you get around him, and he's got the length. He's got the size they like. And I think, they're, I think it sounds like they're intrigued by him. So – but we don't know, right? And here's the other problem with, like, the guys who are the holdovers, Forbes and St. Juice in particular, what difference will the coaching make? And I'm not going to blame everything on Forbes on coaching because, like, players got to take – or for, or St. Juice for that matter. Players have to take some responsibility and accountability for their own play. However, you know, I, I, I don't think that was the best situation for them. And the, whether the way you were used or just – what you're, you know, the coaching in general, whatever. So I think they're in a better spot with that. How much difference will that make? Um, you know, I think the, I think again, Forbes' ability to take the ball away is intriguing, but I don't know what's going to happen there because that's again, let's, you got to wait till training camp to see. I mean, you see sometimes like, okay, Forbes looks pretty good here, but there are times last summer he looked pretty good too. So I want to see him against, like those joint practices for those guys will be telling because yeah. I thought the Baltimore joint practices were very telling for Forbes as well and not in a good way. And then like, I think the, you know, it's, it's what do you do with, I'm assuming Sam is the guy, they drafted him. They love the guy. Um, he's going to, I mean, he'll be the slot corner, Yes. but then like the other, to, along with that though, is how do you, you know, using guys like Quan Martin, Jeremy Chin as safeties and Quan can cover in the slot. What is, you know, how, you know, there's a versatility that you can tap into, but I don't know, man, I, 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 that's going to be the, that will be in, in addition to left tackle, that's the number one area to watch because yeah. all this talk about energy, all this talk about all this, if your corners can't play, you know, some, the energy is not going to, the energy is not no. going to save you. Well, it, it, you know, the joint practices, it, they actually line up really well to show what Forbes is. Look who the practices right. are against, the Jets and the Dolphins, with their receiving yeah. cores and those quarterbacks, yeah. and those receiving cores and quarterbacks probably aren't going to play in the preseason games. So those joint practices right. are going to be enormous when Forbes is lining up yeah. on Garrett Wilson or Tyreek Hill or Jalen Waddell getting passes from Tua and Aaron Rodgers as opposed, yeah. as opposed to whatever's going to happen in those preseason games. A thousand percent, that's a great point. <laughs> yeah, no, that's why, and I'll tell you, like, I like that they're having joint practices against two different teams this year too. So as opposed to like Baltimore and I like the joint, I like two day joint practices. I'm fine with that because you get a lot of good work, but I do like it against different teams because now you're, you know, if again, you can get used to something, you can start to read something, get a feel for something. It also leads to a lot more fights when you have more than one day. Um, but I think, you know, like this gives you a chance to work against two different teams. So it's like having, you know, two more preseason games yeah. for them and better because you get so much more situational and it's against different styles. So I like that a lot. I think it'll be, that's one thing that again, uh, you know, and some of it was, some of it was pandemic related, 
but I, I just felt like there were like the previous staff was very slow at times to get a read on certain players and it hurt them. Yeah. Um, and I think these things help you get better, a better read and specifically to the position you're talking about. All right. Mini camp next week. I'll see you out there. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Yeah, Bram. All right. That's uh, John Kime from ESPN. John Kime report.